So welcome. I'm very excited about getting started today. I just want to share a few reflections with you and then introduce our first speaker. Um, and that reflection is that last night we had a speaker's dinner and a number of interesting points were made. I'm sure many of them will come up again today. But one big takeaway, which I think uh, the ambassador left us with, was that uh, an homage to the spirit of the Ukrainian people and how much they have accomplished despite so many challenges and setbacks. And so I, um, I wanted to just start the day with that because we ended last night with that. And I think it was a very powerful um, um, idea. And we should keep that in mind today, no matter what we talk about. Uh, the other thing I wanted to share, and I'll come back to this later in the day, as will other speakers, is one thing about uh, Ukraine and its current um, situation that's so fascinating is that the more you delve into it, the more you realize that the issues that Ukraine is confronting, struggling with, accomplish its accomplishments, are very much intersect with some of the major issues of the globe today, whether it's cybersecurity, whether it's displaced persons, whether it's regional politics. And I can go on, and I will go on later, but just keep that in mind, sort of the larger framework of the things we're going to be talking about today. Um, a couple of uh, um, just, you know, housekeeping things. Each panel will talk among themselves and will be moderated, and then there will be Q&A with you. Um, so we're hoping it's a discussion. We're calling this event um, a salon conference, um, and, and we like this format. So if, I, if it really works, this is all I'm going to do in the future, we've decided. <laughs> um, so uh, let me introduce my co-organizer, um, my co theoretician um, who really took the lead in launching the conference and then I just kind of helped with my wonderful um, staff um, making it happen and being in touch with all of you and organizing it intellectually. So Colonel Liam Collins is somebody who's probably not new to any of you. He's certainly not new to me. I first encountered him when he was running the counterterrorism center, combating terrorism center at um, West Point. Now he's running, as you see, the Modern War Institute. And goodness knows in five years what you're going to be doing, what, what new institute you're going to be running and directing. He's been working with General Abizaid in region, in Ukraine, working with um, the defense to strategize um, and build up the capacity of the Ukrainian um, um, army. Uh, and he is just a wonderful colleague to work with, I have to say. Even when he's halfway around the globe, he answers my, please call me right now, I need to ask you a question. Uh, and I think he will have um, a lot to contribute today throughout the day. But first, I want him to come and make the first introduction of the day. Liam. All right, so first I want to welcome everybody to the conference. Uh, yeah, when, when we uh, came up with the idea of doing or being told to do the conference a few months ago, I'm not sure why I agreed to it, because I realized I couldn't delegate any of it down to my staff. And so uh, then I realized I had to uh, do most of the work for the conference, along with Karen and her staff, which had been great. So uh, yeah, they don't let her fool you. They did the lion's share of the work on this thing. Uh, many of you I know, so it's good to see you again. And for, for those that I don't know, I look forward to hearing what you have to say today. Uh, and as, as Karen said, and as many of you know, I've been moonlighting as General Abizade's XO for the last two years going over to Ukraine. Uh, like I said, moonlighting while I'm trying to run an institute and teach, uh, teach the cadets. So uh, I remember one time we are there in the uh, anti-terrorist operation basically on the front lines on a Friday and 24 hours later administering a final exam to the cadets in, in the course. Uh, so we probably have hundreds of meetings over the last couple years, you know, some more memorable, uh, y you know, than others. Uh, so I'll just tell one short story, I guess. General Abizade should probably close his ears on this one because he doesn't know this one totally. Uh, so, uh, so, so we were in the uh, White House probably on H.R. McMaster's second week on the job. So we're meeting with him in the West Wing, uh, talk about Ukraine. Uh, so we, when we get in there, we're following him and his staff down there to a conference room on the West Wing. And then you know, as the meeting gets on, uh, General McMaster's like, hey, sir, I want you to come up, meet the staff, meet the staff. So we go up there, follow him up there. And again, we're just following along, so you're not really paying attention to which way you're going. We get up there to his, uh, his office, and he's like, and he, he's introducing General Abizade, and he's like, uh, McMaster, the worst XO I ever had. He left my bag this one time. And I, all I can think is, oh, crap. I just left his bag somewhere in the White, in the White House. 
So I turn around and I run out of there and I'm like, I don't know where to go because I was just following along. So I run to this door and there's a door and I'm like, I think it's through here and it's locked. And there's a phone on the wall. I'm like, well, I'll just pick up the phone. There's a voice on the other end, hello? And I'm like, can you open the door? Buzz is open. I'm like, all right, I, I'm getting closer. And then you go through the door and there's like three other doors. You're like, which one do I take? Am I going to go into a conference of, you know, vice president or someone's in there? So open the first door. No one's in there. Open the second door. There's our room. I grab the bag. Now I still got to figure out how to get back to McMaster's office. Run around through the maze to get back up there and get up there just as we're leaving. And I'm like, here you go. Here's your bag, sir. So until now, he never knew that. Uh, so I just kind of wrecked that one. Uh, I guess the moral of the story is, uh, if there is one, uh, do a better job at selecting your XO than, than General Abizade does. Uh, or maybe, uh, maybe, the, maybe it is, is when you're working in this part of the world, uh, you're always going to hit unexpected twists and turns, uh, both figuratively and, and literally. So uh, I'm sure we've all kind of experienced those things of working in this part of the world. Uh, but now I'll turn it over. Uh, General Abizade doesn't really need an introduction, so let him give some uh, introductory comments. Yeah, thanks, Liam. Thanks, everybody. Uh, it's great to see you here. Glad you're here. Uh, Karen, where are you? You didn't leave already, did you? You're in charge of this thing. Uh, Karen Greenberg and the uh, Center on National Security, along with Liam Collins and West Point um, Modern Warfare Institute, uh, they've really done a good job in putting all this together. And it's a great opportunity to get together with experts on the region and compare notes and think about where things are headed in Ukraine. Um, Liam, I want you to know that I was expecting to see 15 cadets here, but they're all late. This is uh, obviously a manifestation of your incredible leadership. Thank you <laughs> for having them not show up. You're going to be walking here. Your sure, yeah. But cadets being late really bothers me. It, one thing about training the Ukrainian army, something else again about cadets being late. But look, uh, I have some very short remarks to make about uh, big issues that I see. Of course, I was hired to be in the, essentially the, the Secretary of Defense's security sector uh, reform person for uh, Ukraine's armed forces. So Ash Carter hired me when uh, the new administration came in. Uh, Jim Mattis asked me to stay on, so for the past two years, along with my international comrades, we have figured out how to establish and organize, yeah, establish and establish, I hate that, uh, okay, is it working now? Can you hear me? Yes? Here we go. Um, I hate being in the corner there, backed up behind the podium. It just doesn't work. And, and we were asked to come in, and I had essentially two missions. Number one, coordinate the U.S. effort. And the U.S. effort is not massive on the scale of Iraq and Afghanistan and other places, uh, but coordinate the U.S. effort to the extent that you can. Come back, report to the senior leadership here in the United States about how things are going, uh, what level of support we need to continue to give work with the ambassador and her team to make sure um, we're moving together bilaterally with the Ukrainians in a way that made sense for the problems that they face. The other part of the mission was to uh, be part of the Defense Reform Advisory Board. Now, this ac an acronym stands for DRAB. I mean, can you imagine being on a team that's known as the DRAB? Well, two of my colleagues here, Jill Sinclair from Canada and Nick Parker from the UK. We have colleagues from Lithuania, Germany. Uh, we used to have a Polish colleague, but uh, we're waiting for a replacement to come in. But it's essentially a coalition of the willing of people and countries that want to organize and help Ukraine's collective defense efforts. And uh, that has been quite an interesting job in assessing and helping to give advice about the pace of reform. So I, I've got a few headlines that I want to leave you with. I'm assuming that most of you understand the broader issues about Ukraine. I'm not going to talk about our many successes or our uh, most difficult problems. I'm going to talk about uh, things that I think we need to pay attention to. First of all, there's no solution to the security problems in Ukraine without reform. 
Reform has got to happen. And reform has got to happen across the board, not just in the security sector. Uh, many of you were here last night. I know all of you were not, but last night I said I was very proud of the work that has been done in helping the Ukrainians uh, by the international community, but I'm more proud of the work that the Ukrainians have done in helping themselves defend themselves against a very difficult and aggressive opponent. So security sector reform is a window on the larger issues of reform. Uh, there are many important advances that have been made there, uh, but we should not kid ourselves that the process is anywhere close to being completed. It is a long road, but there's no solution to Ukraine's problem without reform. Second big point I want to make sure people take from me anyway, is something I've told soldiers throughout my whole life, which is never underestimate the enemy. We always, we Americans in particular, underestimate the enemy on you know, many occasions. And we always do so uh, much to our chagrin. But the international community underestimates the aggressiveness and capabilities of what the Russians are doing with their military forces and their political plan of action. They underestimate this very, very difficult form of hybrid warfare that they're waging against the Ukrainians. They underestimate Russia's geopolitical pushback. You know, NATO has gone about as far east as the Russians are going to let it go. And from this point on, the Russians are pushing back and while I wouldn't say that they're pushing back to conquer Ukraine, I would say they are very interested in ensuring that Ukraine stays in Russia's sphere of influence. And they're working hard militarily, politically, diplomatically, and economically to make that happen. And I respect Russia's military capabilities and the reform-minded spirit of their own officers and leadership. And I have watched them put together military power and use it in a way that I haven't seen in a long time. You know, we Americans have been fighting in the Middle East for 17 years. We fought a very unsophisticated enemy, but to see the Russians come to town and use very sophisticated electronic warfare, cyber warfare, propaganda, special forces, air defense techniques, to name but a few, in a way that is far from the front line, but close enough to the front line to affect the outcome of the battle on the front line. And uh, we need to pay attention. What watching what goes on in Ukraine has taught me is that if this technique is applied in places like Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, that are NATO allies, it will present a huge problem for the alliance in figuring out how to deal with it. And we need to really understand that. Um, the other thing I'd say about the Russians is, look, I'm, I'm a, stu a student of Russian history and Russian military history in particular. I don't regard this as a return of the Soviet Union. I regard this as a continuation of Russian imperial ambitions. You know, make sure that you dominate the countries around you. Make sure that they fall squarely in your sphere of influence. Push as far as you can until somebody stops you. And oh, by the way, make sure that you are making a few flanking movements here and there in places like Syria in order to keep everybody guessing about what your next move will be. The Russians are not 10 feet tall, but they deserve our respect and they deserve some sort of a concerted effort in understanding what hybrid warfare means to us and to the alliance. Um, next point, stabilize the patient. Who's the patient? Ukraine. Needs to be stabilized. When I was in Iraq, one of the senior Iraqis told me right after we um, had completed the invasion in, in 2003 and started to have our difficulties with the insurgency, he said, you Americans drive me crazy. Here we are, we've been just hit by a train and we're unconscious, and you throw us up on the operating table and you say, what, what's wrong with you? <laughs> well, you know, what's wrong with you is that we've taken a country like this and turned it like that. Well, this war has taken Ukraine and the revolution preceding it, taken Ukraine like this and moved it like that, and moving back to a, a point of stabilization takes an awful lot of time, effort, and energy. The friction associated with the need to stabilize the patient is enormous. 
and it's just not stabilized the military, it's stabilized all sectors of Ukraine's government, economy, and ability to compete in the modern world. Next point, we must, if we want to stabilize the, the patient, build international support and establish coordination. And we really haven't done that very well. We have an awful lot of international things going on to help the Ukrainians, many of which are unconnected, many of which are uncoordinated. As the ambassador knows, and this is a great ambassador, by the way, I think those of you that had the great opportunity to hear her last night understand that. But I have been talking to the ambassador week after week after week about building some sort of a military coordination center to ensure that the military efforts of the allies get coordinated, become more efficient and effective because the efforts are small. And when they're small, they have to be better coordinated. And that goes for other sectors in Ukraine. I'm sure the Minister of Health, ma'am, the Minister of Health here, has the same sorts of problem. I've got lots of help, but I need help that I can coordinate, that she can coordinate, that we can coordinate, that we can agree on a plan of action, and then move ahead efficiently. There's an awful lot of international goodwill, but not a lot of good international coordination. What's the next point? Mind the gaps. And this is, of course, a great British slogan, right? Mind the gaps, you get off the train, mind the gap. What's the gaps? Ukraine's a nation of stovepipes. Every stovepipe goes to the top. No stovepipe connects to the right or to the left. You know, no modern country can exist if you don't get the stovepipes under control, and Ukraine has not done that. They haven't done it in the army, they haven't done it in the armed forces, they haven't done it in the intelligence security sector, they haven't done it at Ukro Oberon Prom. And this is the next step of meaningful reform. You've got to mind the gaps. Let's get some horizontal connectivity among institutions to make sure that the stovepipes can efficiently operate in this very tough strategic context that they follow, or that they uh, find themselves in. Next point. Follow the money, right? Follow the money, it's simple. Never have I seen a place that has so little transparency in the flow of budgetary resources and understanding of how money is spent to achieve national or military aims. You can't give a contractor money to buy food for the army and expect him to deliver if you don't monitor it properly or fuel or rations, or whatever the case may be. Lack of transparency in budgetary process, lack of transparency in the accountability of resources have got to be fixed, and people have to understand that only when you achieve transparency of resources and transparency of budgetary flow can you begin to have a rational effect on what you're trying to accomplish. We have made some progress in the military. There's a better accountability of the flow of logistics resources to the front line. There's a better accountability in understanding the flow of money going into the pockets of new recruits, sergeants that are being built, special forces operators that are trying to come into the force. Um, but it's still not what it should be. It's also important to understand that in following the money, when you build too many different stovepipes, like I talked about in the previous point, and you give them all their own amount of money to only be used there, it lacks the ability of the rest of the institutions of the government to move money when they need to when there's an emergency. And so it's essential that um, you know, these problems get solved. In the military in particular, you've got so many different organizations that are independent and, and they have to come under much better control, much better budgetary control, and much better coordination. Uh, this is not to say they're, they're not making efforts to do that, but the whole notion of civilian control of the military, first and foremost, 
requires transparency in budgetary flows. And it also requires another thing that is interesting about Ukraine, which is overclassification of everything. How many tanks do you have, Lieutenant? Can't tell you, classified. How much does this tank cost? Can't tell you, it's classified. It, you know, everything is classified to include the money. So you've got to declassify things so you can follow the money in order to uh, obtain some effect. So I've said all these things that everybody's clutching their heart about saying, oh my God, how can we fix anything? Well, the truth of the ma matter is, I'm gonna give you the last point here, which is keep calm and carry on. Ukraine is making progress. They're not afraid. Their soldiers are fighting. Their institutions are getting better. They recognize their problems. They want to have a better future for their country and for their people. The international community needs to understand that the front line of the international community, at least those of us that value freedom and dignity, is really on the border with Russia and Ukraine. And we need to give them the wherewithal to be able to resist, not against a massive Russian attack, but resist in order for the international community to help find Ukraine and Russia together to find a solution to the problems that will allow Ukraine to move forward independently and without the aggressive interference of a neighbor uh, that should know better. So look, I have great faith in Ukraine. I have faith primarily because I've been to the front line many times, not many times, but enough times, to see the soldiers on the front line facing the enemy and see that they are prepared to do their duty. Any country that has soldiers willing to fight and defend their way of life for what they think is right deserves the respect of the international community, but moreover, they deserve the help of the international community. We don't have to do a lot more to help Ukraine be successful, but in my view, we must figure out how to do more if they are gonna be successful. We've gotta coordinate, we've gotta stabilize, we've gotta make sure that we give advice that is sensible, and when we know that there's a problem, we can't walk away from it. We can't say that reform is so important to us that it's okay for the army in the field to fall apart. Absolutely not. The army in the field has got to keep doing their duty. Reform's got to keep moving forward, and we have to work with the Ukrainians to make that happen. Ukraine will solve Ukraine's problem, not the international community. But if we allow financial difficulties to overtake Ukraine that create a problem for them where they're not able to field forces and use resources to defend themselves, then we might as well have gone home five years ago. So thanks very much. Look forward to the conference. Should be fun.